What's that like? What's going on, people? Hey, it's another edition of the What's That Like podcast, and I am your host, John Knowles. Good to be back on the audio show. It's been certainly a while since we did that. Uh, I've got a great guest lined up for you today. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a second. But first, I want to thank all of you for supporting everything else that's been going on on the What's That Like? I'll call it the network. Uh, we've got a lot of audio shows. We've been doing a lot of videos that get a lot of views as well. We've we visited the Christmas Story House with my friend of mine, Bruce Colbeck, and I've had a lot of people asking me, is that guy really like that in real life? And the answer is yes, 100%. Bruce is uh, truly a unique individual, and he's one of my good friends, and I've known him for almost 20 years, and uh, we have a good time together when we do those things. We travel a lot for work, he and I, and sometimes we just find ourselves in interesting places, and and you can see the result of, of, of what happens when we do. So look for more of those maybe in the future. We might... Uh, we might have some other trips coming up that we might be able to get something off to, but uh, Bruce is always going to be a good friend of the show, and I want to thank him for doing that. Also, Turner Fest was just this last weekend. It was a big success here in Mount Olive. If you saw the video that we did with Randy Bursch and Adam Gaffney or you listened to the show and you went out there and checked it out, uh, I think you probably had a good time. They had a great crowd out there. Steve Ewing headlining Orange Punch Warfare is a great night for them. They had a lot of food trucks down from St. Louis, and I know they had a good night as well. And I want to thank you all for tuning in every Friday night at about 9 p.m. as I always go live from Turner Hall for their weekly Queen of Hearts drawing. That is something that is continuing to grow here we are i think it's mid-september about the third week of september now and that pot's going to be over ninety thousand dollars and people ask me all the time hey I, I saw that on your show uh how does that work and if you go back and listen to the episode we had with the turner hall gang uh back earlier in the summer they'll explain the whole thing to you it's the same game that's been going on since february of this year there's 54 cards on a board. Every week, there's a drawing. Everybody buys in tickets. They draw one name. That one person has the opportunity to pull one card off that board. If that one card is the Queen of Hearts, they win. That's how it works. We don't draw a number of names. It's one name. One card gets drawn, and it just keeps rolling over until someone hits that Queen of Hearts. So I think we're 28 cards in now out of 54. We just crossed the halfway mark. This thing could keep going for a while. We're not even potentially close to the end, but every card that comes off is just one more little bit of a chance that that Queen of Hearts is going to get drawn the next time. So if you like watching those, like I said, 9 p.m. every Friday night, I've got a lot of people that message me on on uh, Facebook, or they text me throughout the week going, hey, we can't make it this week. Are you going to video again? Yeah, I'll, I'll be there doing it. I I'll be there this week on, on 9-15, but I won't be there um, the week after that on the 22nd. I'll be out of town. So if you're used to those videos, you might just have to go up to Turner Hall to watch it yourself. So I want to give a shout out also to a, a friend of ours on the show, and that's Pete Visentine from Fight to Fight. Pete recently is responding to a lot of the hurricane thing that's been going on in our country, and you know all know how people are, and Americans are affected by that. He's been doing some fundraising there. So if you can, go out to fighttofight.com or find Pete Visentine and Fight to Fight on Facebook. There's some good deals out there. He's doing some fundraisers for some shirts that's going to help out a lot of these folks um, it, it, due to the recent hurricanes. I think that's a great thing as well. All right, let's get to my next guest. Skip Talbot is a storm chaser from Springfield, Illinois. Now, this is one of the most requested topics I've had since I started the show. It's, I wanted you to get a ghost hunter, and I wanted you to get this, and I wanted you to get that. And storm chaser was at the top of that list. It, it was one of the things that people wanted to hear a lot about, apparently. And I was able to find uh, someone. I want to thank William Zake. He's of the Central Illinois Storm Chasers Facebook page. I started searching around to figure out where I could find a storm chaser i found williams page the central illinois storm chaser facebook page and i asked the question i'm like who is out there that's an active chaser that wouldn't mind coming on the podcast and william actually pointed me towards skip i contacted skip 
We've been bouncing around with schedules for a while, but we were finally able to hook up this past Monday on 9-11 in the evening and record a show. And I'll just give you a fair warning if you haven't noticed already when you downloaded it. It's a long one. It's probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about an hour and a half. I thought about breaking it into two episodes, and I thought, well, why would I do that? Those of you that want a long episode, you'll listen to the whole thing all the way through as doing whatever you do. If I broke it into two episodes, I'd be you know, basically making people wait for the next one. So I thought, why don't I just put it all in one? If you don't get all through it in your first listening, you can pick it up right where you left off and finish it out as you go by. But I think you're going to enjoy it. Skip's a great guy. We did this one via phone, and you'll hear the audio difference a little bit, so I apologize for that. But it came out pretty good, and I know a lot of you want to hear about storm chasing and what it's like. What was little Skip Talbot like? Oh, uh, what was I like when I was young? Yeah. Well, I grew up in the I grew up in the Chicago suburbs, and so I guess that's what really got me started in, in weather and my interest in tornadoes was when I was seven or eight years old. A uh, a tornado hit the town of Plainfield. It was about seven miles from where I live. And it wasn't just any tornado. This was an F5. Um, that's as strong as they get. It was incredibly destructive. It was like an atomic bomb had been dropped on this town. Mm -hmm. And so when that happened, seeing such an awesome force happen so close to my house, I was immediately just awestruck and consumed by by what had happened. Mm -hmm. and, and since then, I've just been fascinated by tornadoes and weather in general so so that that's kind of what happened when i was young but uh yeah I, I had a lot of interest growing up um i was i was also in aviation and uh my dad built an airplane i grew up around planes and uh, i wound up actually getting my private pilot's license later on uh in life and and yeah and all of that's kind of come full circle too so i've sometimes i've i've gone Aerial storm chasing. Um, I've flown uh, aircraft trying to see tornadoes too. So, so yeah, that's that's kind of where I came from growing up in the Chicago suburbs. Yeah, and uh, getting early experiences with weather and 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 the sky really and flying and and that kind of stuff. So, at what age did you decide this was something a career path? Was there a seminal event? Well, you talked about the seminal event of the Plainfield tornado. But what age did you actually yeah. like get in a car and go, well, I got to go see this? Yeah, that's a great question. So the Plainfield tornado is is what kind of lit the spark in my interest. And a lot of old timer chasers will really cringe at this. I'm not ashamed to say it at all. But what really got me moving down the path towards storm chasing was the movie Twister. <laughs> I saw that movie when I was 13 uh, in middle school and after I saw that movie, I was so awestruck that I decided right then and there that I was going to be a storm chaser. So that that was what decide that's what brought it, you know, forefront to me that this is what I'm going to do with my life. Um, and it was a number of years, of course, before I was actually storm chasing. So it wasn't like I had just seen the movie and then got out there and, and started doing it, or the movie was, you know, my primary education source. No, it was years of studying and. And learning from others and, you know, going out there and learning by trial and error before um, I was actually a storm chaser. You mentioned that a lot of old school chasers would maybe look down on that. But I would guess yeah. many of the people out there just like you, your age, probably had the same story. Yeah, absolutely. So there, there are a couple big booms or spikes in, in storm chasing's popularity. And, of course, Twister was the most massive spike of all it brought a large number of people to the hobby and uh so yeah twister and then the storm chasers show which you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. uh, that was another big draw my son's 14 now but growing up probably from the time he was three or four or five that was probably his favorite movie when we would drive anywhere in the van that went in the dvd player and i would bet you we could quote you 
I could I could go toe to toe with you on quotes from the movie Twister, <laughs> and it's not all the just yeah. the normal ones. It's the and actually we were talking before we came on, and I said, "Hey, I'm going to talk to a storm chaser," and he and I asked, "Do you have any?" questions you'd like me to ask him and he wanted to know what really is the safest orifice to get hidden if you're going to get struck by lightning <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that's really funny um yeah no I, I think i think twister got that pretty right you want to get low and uh and you want to <laughs> you will probably want to put your butt up in the air i think i i'll agree with twister on that one no yeah i love the movie and um we quote it constantly when we're storm chasing. About half the movie gets quoted on any given chase. It's really a yeah, language. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 It's amazing how many people still love that movie. It's 20 years old now, but it's still uh, – young kids still love it, and I still meet really young people who it's their favorite movie, and it's still inspiring people to get – interested in in weather and meteorology and, and learning about storm chasing no uh <laughs> great movie we, we certainly quoted a lot in our house you know all the you know that's no moon that's a space station and what 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 are some <laughs> of your favorites what are the things that get quoted all the time from the movie twister oh my gosh there's so many i could go on for an hour just on this um one of our favorite lines is what is this bob's road and that's <laughs> we we're constantly we're constantly turning onto these, what we call the grid, is the unpaved road grid. There's a mile-by-mile mile, mm -hmm. um, farm road grid. And, you know, whenever the road starts to get a little iffy condition-wise, it's, you know, the Bob's Road reference comes out. <laughs> well, you got to ask Rabbit, because Rabbit is yeah. good, and Rabbit is <laughs> rabbit wise. Rabbit is good, Rabbit is wise, <laughs> that one constantly as well. So. <laughs> what, did that, what did that movie get right? Great question. Um, there's so much... There are so many little errors and things that I love to point out about it um, and so much that it got wrong, but it did do some things right. Twister, to me, captured some of the awe and wonder and some of the power that these storms have. And a lot of movies have tried to follow it or reproduce it or do something like that, but to me, Twister really captured that. The, the actors... When they look at the storm, when they interact with the storm, some of their emotions, I feel like, are, are pretty real. And to me, that's what really helps make it a great movie. And, and a lot of that wonder and awe, I think, is lost on some, some other movies, some more recent ones. What did it get wrong? You mentioned that you'd like to point out the little inaccuracies. What, what are some of the things that it doesn't portray? The, and this is a problem universally with almost all movies. One of the things it doesn't show is the, the kind of the parent storm structure. So tornadoes come out of what we call supercell thunderstorms. And the supercell is an awesome beast on its own. And that storm shows so much power and intricate structure and beauty and dynamic processes. And when all that structure comes together, you see this whole swirling storm mass and the tornado comes out of that it really frames the tornado and it, and it puts it in a perspective and it highlights its power. And that is missing from almost every movie I watch. So in almost every movie, the tornado is coming out of just this nondescript deck of stratus, which mm -hmm. is totally inaccurate. There's a lot of structure above the tornado that I'm looking at that tells me where that tornado is, where it's going to be, how strong it might be. And that's usually missing from a movie. Like the tornado just instantly comes out of a, a flat cloud. And so it, I feel like if they added that structure into the movie, if they tried to show that realistically, it would just make the, tr the tornado so much more dramatic. What, what about the science that they tried to put in it? The Dorothy, the Dot 3, the things that they built, uh, similar stuff to that in, in real existence? Yeah. So they actually tried to try to mimic what had been done in the past. So the Dorothys in Twister were based off of what was called TOTO, uh, or the Totable Tornado Observatory. So back in the day, back in the 1980s, the National Severe Storms Laboratory was toting around these um, tin cans with all of these weather instruments, and they would try to deploy them in the path of a tornado, and then they would try to get out. And it's incredibly difficult to do because the, the path is so skinny and narrow, and they had, they had kind of mixed... Um, results on, on getting these probes into the paths of tornadoes. But, but that's kind of what it's based off of. Of course, the movie makes it much more 
dramatic. They're, you know, they're getting dangerously close to the tornado, um, and the the, uh, the cans are filled with these little probes that go up into the funnel. That was kind of an added thing that the the actual mm-hmm. probes didn't do. But uh, but yeah, that's what it's based off of. Moving on from Twister, as you said, we could probably talk about that all night. But that's 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 yeah. a movie. I want to talk about the real thing. What was your level of education? Is this something you went and got a formal education in, Skip? Not really. We talked a little bit about how I grew up. The other big aspect of my life was that um, I was also a big computer geek. So I grew up around computers and, and really got into computers. So that's what I got it, went to school for. Um, I got a computer science degree, and um, I'm a software developer. That's that's my regular day job. Mm-hmm. And, and so while I was in college, I did take uh, a meteorology course, and, and I did try to do the, the National Weather Service spotter training, which is, of course, your very basic introductory level mm-hmm. um, education on, on thunderstorms. But, but otherwise, I'm primarily self-taught. I'm reading books, and I'm going on the Internet, and I'm reading from other storm chasers and other meteorologists. And, uh, and I'm taking that, and I'm trying it on my own in the field. And then that's that's the rest of my education is it's trial and error and learning the hard way out there on the plains. So would you consider yourself an amateur or a professional in this field? Right. So that gets into a little bit about what storm chasing is. And to me, storm chasing for the vast majority is it's a hobby. The people who are professional storm chasers are usually doing some other job. They just happen to be storm chasing for that job. Either they're meteorologists, they're doing atmospheric research, perhaps they're a TV show producers, um, and, and they have to chase for a TV show. Sometimes they are getting footage for a news outlet, so they're, they're media stringers. They happen to be storm chasers. Um, but for the vast majority of people, it's, it's folks who have an interest in storm chasing, and they are going out and doing it on their own as a glorified hobby, myself included. Now, I do... I'm currently working with some atmospheric scientists doing some tornado research. And previously, I've done some professional film shoots making a storm chasing movies. Um, but those are kind of special projects that, that I do on the side. That's not all of the storm chasing I do. Most of the chasing I do is on my own and on my own money. So okay. I'm going out there on my own for my own reasons. Okay. So when, when was your first intercept and where? My first storm chase was on May 10th, 2003, in central Illinois in the Peoria area. Okay. And I had been studying meteorology and reading up on storm chasing for a couple of years now. I hadn't done it yet. So I had, even though I had been reading a lot on it, I had no idea what I was doing. So there just happened to be a high risk tornado outbreak one night and I was in college at the University of Illinois and I gathered up some of my friends and I said, hey, let's jump in the car, let's go storm chasing. We took a weather radio with us and we stumbled out into the darkness on what was a massive and violent tornado outbreak. And luckily we didn't kill ourselves. We wound up driving into the core of a tornado worn supercell in the dark It was hailing and raining. We couldn't see a thing. It was pitch black. And over the roar of the hail, we could hear the tornado sirens wailing in the distance. Oh, boy. And we thought we were going to die. And my friends were about ready to murder me (laughs) uh, because I had put them into this situation. But we drove out of it. We did not see a tornado. We were a few miles from one. Uh, But we got out of there. We lived to tell about it. Um, To me, it was kind of a, a colossal blunder. You know, to me, uh, storm chasing has been about going out there and stumbling into it. But I, I've learned from my mistakes and and lived from them to, to go on and, and do better the next time. So <laughs> I, I wouldn't see my first tornado until a year later um, on April 20th, 2004. We had a surprise tornado outbreak again in central Illinois. Mm-hmm. And I had finally had all the pieces together and and had a successful storm intercept. I drove north um, after school and saw a beautiful supercell thunderstorm. And just like textbook, it spun up a nice, pretty tornado right at sunset for me. And that was one of the most pivotal moments of my life. Just seeing that tornado in person for the first time, it was just awe-inspiring. And 
And I knew that this was going to be a lifelong passion for me. You, you mentioned how that was all inspiring and I'll follow it up. I'll kind of go off topic to come back on topic. Did you happen to catch the eclipse a couple of weeks ago? I did. Um, we drove down to the, the Ohio River, just north of Paducah. Okay. And uh, we found a great spot at a rest stop because I had the whole family with us. They had a playground and bathrooms and, and everything, so it was a good spot. So we hunkered down there. Um, we saw the start of the eclipse, and, and we saw all of the wondrous effects, and it was totally awesome. But then shortly after totality started, a small cloud oh, blocked no. the rest of it for yeah. us. So we saw it, but we didn't get the full show that everyone else yeah. did. So and I, and I was pretty bummed about that. But but yeah, a lot of my friends they they really compare the the wonder and the awe of the total eclipse to what it's like to see a tornado. Well, so that it's, that it's that's why I asked similar. the question because I I had taken the day off work and here in Mount Olive where where I live and I record this. We were about 60 miles, 50 miles north of the path. So I drove to Waterloo, Illinois. They had a big celebration there. Great, great, great time um, at the Waterloo Solar Bration, I think they called it. The weather just cooperated perfectly. And the moment that thing went to totality and I flipped those glasses off, I got to tell you, that's what I felt. I called it the religious experience that I've had probably without the religion part of it, you know, just, oh, yeah. just amazing how you, no picture does it justice. And, and, and I was uh, just looking at it, I'm going, I've got to see the next one in 2024. I guess the difference between eclipse chasing, which I, I think they call them umbra files. If I, if, if, if I've got that right, the shadow chasers Absolutely. and tornado chasing is, you know, when the eclipses are coming, <laughs> right? So I, I'm assuming that that sunk down into you when you saw that first tornado. And, and as you said, that sparked a, a lifelong passion. Now that's become a huge part of your life, I'm guessing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's just something about witnessing such rare power and, and, and a beautiful spectacle, and, and it's an terrible force, too. And when you see that and when you experience it, it, it just totally overwhelms you, and, and it's now become a life-consuming obsession for me. So I devote huge amounts of my time and energy and money toward this pursuit. So tell me when you started, I'm guessing, taking the spring off. You know, what does that season start? Uh, late April into June and heading into the Great Plains. Yeah, tornado season um, for the plains in the Midwest usually starts to get going around late March. Uh, and April is really kind of the official start of tornado season, especially here in Illinois. In Illinois, April is our peak tornado season when we're getting those warm fronts lifting up from the south. In general, the, the season peaks in mid-May across the central Great Plains. And then it goes well into June. And then by late June, it's usually tapering down again as the jet stream migrates north into Canada and the weather starts to calm down. We get kind of those summer doldrums. When did you start heading out there and, and how? Just throw it all in a minivan and roll? Yeah, so as I was getting into storm chasing, I kind of knew that's where it was going and what I was going to be doing. So once I started storm chasing in 2003, from the very start, it was it was turning into a, a growing a growing thing where I would be going out more and more and driving further and further. Um, by after my first couple of years, I was making multiple trips out to out to the Great Plains and back, driving uh, thousands of miles every year trying to catch tornadoes. And, and now it's to the point where I am doing maybe 20,000 miles a year and chasing 20 or more times to places as far as New Mexico and Montana mm -hmm. uh, and, and back. Tell me about the early days. The early days of storm chasing was me either taking a friend out or going with a local storm chaser. So... And again, this is a glorified hobby, so I'm going out with people who are like me. They're interested in, in witnessing and documenting tornadoes. So, um, yeah, so it's just other storm chaser hobbyists like myself. Um, later on, as I got more and more involved in the storm chasing community and, and with meteorologists, um, I was involved with a few teams. 
Um, I chased with uh, the College of DuPage. They have an awesome storm chasing program where they'll take meteorology students out to the field. I was a driver for them for one season. Um, I also had the opportunity of being a forecaster and navigator for a Sean Casey um, tornado IMAX movie. So I got to be on that crew for a couple of seasons. And most recently, for the past two seasons, I've been working with a couple of atmospheric scientists studying tornadoes. But most often, you can spot me with my regular chase partner, uh, Jennifer Brindley Ubel. Mm -hmm. She's a professional photographer out of Milwaukee. And, uh, and that's pretty much what I've, how I've spent the, the bulk of, the, of my chasing for the past six years or so. As you'll spot the two of us out there, she's what I would call my regular storm chasing partner. And, uh, and it's great having an extra person out there with you. So, yeah, it's usually just the two of us, and, and we're doing different things. Um, she's getting a lot of our still photography, and she's doing a lot of the eyes in the sky and looking out for tornadoes while I'm focusing more on the driving and navigating and forecasting. So so how does let's, – let's walk through – how you're getting going uh you're you're a couple of it's it's late april or mid april and you're sitting at home and you're watching the weather in the midwest yeah what's yeah, the tripping points that you're looking for and then how do you pick where you're gonna go don't talk to me about the decision points you make yeah absolutely that's totally where it starts it starts at, at home with watching the weather and i'm on my computer and i'm looking at what we call numerical forecast models and these models try to approximate what the atmosphere is going to do in the next few days. And they're, they're best guesses. And sometimes they're quite wrong. But we try to use those to gauge where and when the weather is going to be as best as we can. So as much as a week out, if we have a system showing up on these weather models, it gets my attention. I start paying attention, watching to see how this is, event's going to unfold. At two to three days out, if the signal is looking good and consistent, um, I'm going to start picking a target, what we call, um, of where I'm going to go. So if it looks like there's going to be a, a good chance of a tornado, based on what these computer models are plotting on maps for us, um, I'm going to seriously start considering going on a storm chase. I'm going to be packing the car. I'm going to be picking a specific location of where I'm going to be going. I'm going to be getting my cameras ready. If it's out in the Great Plains, then uh, I will typically leave the night before for that chase. And then I will hone in from there to try and find a tornado. I was going to say, how much of that modeling then is the computer doing? How much of that are you interpreting? I mean, it's, it's a mix of both. The computer will show you certain characteristics of the atmosphere. It's up to you to interpret that to get to where you need to be and to, to understand basically the meteorology behind it, how the atmosphere is working, really having the knowledge to know when there's going to be a, a tornado that you can chase and when, the, when there, this is an event that you should avoid. Because a lot of times these weather models are not going to show you specifics. I'm out to get a pretty picture of a tornado, basically, or dramatic tornado video. And the weather models are not going to show that. If you don't have kind of a robust um, understanding of the meteorology behind this, you will miss out or you will what we call bust continuously. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, it, it's a mix. You got to know how to read the weather maps and, and they are a huge boon and they will help you a lot, but you have to understand what they're showing and what it, what they mean, what's going on behind the scenes or else you're missing about half the picture. Are you collaborating with others like you and you're talking a couple of days out? What are you thinking? I'm going here. You go there. One of us will catch it. Uh, you know, what's the community like? So storm chasers are they're kind of strewn about the whole country. And it's the Internet that has really brought us all together. And we've got kind of this loose-knit community where there are different venues where we discuss upcoming events and we share our photos and videos. And, and that's primarily how a lot of storm chasers um, learn and, and meet each other and, and also uh, collaborate on, on what we're doing. So, yeah, absolutely, we discuss the upcoming forecasts, our target plans, and go from there. All right. So say you, you've honed in on a target. You're going to head to Oklahoma, some someplace in Oklahoma. Uh, you leave the night before. You, what type of – you have your – is it your, just your personal vehicle? Do you have a dedicated chasing vehicle? What does that look like for you? My storm chasing vehicle is my daily driver. Um, 
for the past, for most of my storm chasing, I was using a minivan. Okay. And I absolutely love chasing in a minivan. A lot of people think you need a big truck or four wheel drive. You really don't. You just need something that can handle itself on the highway, is in a capable and efficient vehicle. Um, the reason I love minivans so much is because they have a ton of space. Mm -hmm. And I can actually live out of a minivan for about a week. I'll put a full twin mattress in the back, a cooler full of food and water, and I've got all, all the extra room for my laptop, computer, and all my camera equipment. So, yeah, it, it's my daily driver. I also modify my vehicle significantly. My last minivan, I actually cut a 19-inch hole in the roof of the van. And I put a acrylic dome over the top of it that's on a hinge. And on top of that, I mounted a series of cameras. So hmm. those cameras allow me to get a 360-degree shot of the storm um, while I'm in motion, So, which is absolutely amazing. So I can get a tornado that's chasing me down the road behind me without, without having to stop. Storm chasers use any kind, any kind of vehicle. Um, you name it, they're out there chasing in it. I guess it's important, like you said, you have a, a partner, Jennifer, um, who it, it goes out there with you. So one of you is monitoring the weather as you're going. One of you is driving. One of you is navigating. You've each got a role probably out there as this is going on. We are each focused on, on different things at different times. So, And I do chase solo, too. I, I try to work my setup so that I've got kind of a one-man band set up and mm -hmm. can do it by myself. However, it's just so much nicer having somebody with you. So it's an, it's an extra pair of eyes in the sky. It's a reality check. Um, they're giving you better ideas. They can help you navigate. They can be in communication with other chasers. It's invaluable having that extra person with you. So, so Skip, as I've been preparing for the interview, I've been going back through a lot of your, your past chases. You've got a, a website out there. It's skip.cc, right? Is that right? Right. Yeah. So, if, you know, right. anything that you're listening to, if you're listening to this near a computer or when you get home from wherever you're listening to, it's skip.cc. And the photography, the videos that you post, the, the details of everything that you've done in these chases is, to me, phenomenal. I feel like I've, I've gone through, I don't know, half a dozen of these. And I feel like I, I yeah, I feel like I know you pretty well, just the way you write and you talk and everything else, because I've got a window into what your passion is. I, I've noticed a couple of them, though, were kind of some seminal, you know, I don't want to call them high points. That's not the right word, but some kind of some 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 chase logs that you've put out there that are kind of defining moments. And tell me about the chase that you had on May 31st, 2013. Yeah, that's what we call the El Reno event, May 31st, 2013 in El Reno, Oklahoma, is not only a pivotal moment in my storm chasing career, but it was a pivotal moment in storm chasing history. So kind of the setup was we had a, a very volatile setup near Oklahoma City, and a huge number of storm chasers had congregated to the area to, to catch a tornado. And for those that don't know, Oklahoma City is kind of mecca for tornadoes and storm chasers. So it is the absolute hot spot of the country. They have an infamous history with violent tornadoes down there with the University of Oklahoma and the Storm Prediction Center based out of there. Um, it's, it's absolutely the, the central hot spot. So um, everybody and their brother was set up to chase tornadoes that day, and they were expecting some violent tornadoes. And that's exactly what we got. Um, not only was it a violent tornado, but we actually had a record-breaking tornado uh, this tornado was 2.6 miles wide. is the widest tornado on record. We had mobile radars on that tornado that measured winds approaching 300 miles per hour, which is some of the fastest ever measured on Earth. So unfortunately, this tornado was at times difficult to see. Rain wrapped. People couldn't discern where it was. It didn't look like a normal tornado, and it behaved... Um, it behaved kind of erratically. It, uh, it had very fast moving sub vortices inside of it. It accelerated, doubled its speed and width in less than a minute, and then it took a left turn. And that was the perfect mix of, of ingredients and conditions to cause a tragic disaster. And so what happened was we actually had our first tornado-related storm chaser fatalities on that event. 
extremely well-known and respected um, storm chasers, Tim Samaras, his son Paul, and, and Carl Young were killed in that tornado. And, and that was just shocking and devastating to everyone in the community that those three, who many considered were some of the best, would be, would be killed in a tornado like that. The tornado itself was just this absolute record-breaking beast. And, and so much work is now being done studying and learning from that event. A lot of scientific research is coming out of that, out of that storm and that event. But yeah, a pivotal moment for many, myself included, um, witnessing such, such an infamous event like that, having it change your life, change how you think about storm chasing and what it means and, and, and all, of the, all of the other things that went with that, that terrible encounter. So it was a dark day. It was an ugly day. Uh, but it was one of the biggest moments in storm chasing. Absolutely. Well, well, you mentioned Tim and, and Paul and Carl. They were again on, on the Storm Chasers TV show. So, as you said, well-known folks. But you had a connection with them as well. Is that correct? Like I, I noticed on the log, uh, some pictures of them. But were you with them? T Tim was a Tim and Carl, especially. They were great individuals. They were super, super friendly. They would get to know all kinds of storm chasers, and they would take time out of their busy schedules and, and out of their celebrity status as they're shooting TV shows or, or doing scientific research. They would actually stop and, and chat with just, you know, the average Joe storm chasers and, and get to know you and, and share their knowledge and everything. I wasn't super close with Tim and, and, and Carl, but, but yeah, I, I had met and hung out with them a number of times. Tim started the National Storm Chasing Convention, which is still held every year in Denver. He was kind of this focal point, a center of the, of the storm chasing community. My chase partner, Jennifer, she, she knew them much more than I did. Gotcha. Um, she grew up in the Denver area. She knew them personally, and, and it, oh, it was absolutely devastating for her. It's my impression, and again, as a fan of the TV show, you had kind of you know the differing teams. That group in particular seemed to be the one that was the certainly the most safety minded, you know, not going for the, the shot, but certainly going there for the science and not trying to put themselves in harm's way. And that that kind of makes this thing almost uh, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It, it, it odd that this is this is the team that that could have happened to. Would you agree? Yeah, that that's really the feel that most people get out of it, myself included. You know, Tim was, was reserved. He was very careful and, and cautious and, and just, you know, responsible. He knew the risks and, and he took a lot of risks. He, he was a very aggressive storm chaser. I think he got dangerously close a, a number of times. Um, I think it's important to point that out because while Tim comes off as, as very careful and cautious and safe, um, he, he was out there just as much as as anyone else trying to get as close and and okay. you know, the most dramatic shot as they could but but yeah that the way he presented himself it definitely it was definitely very surprising to everyone that that he was going to be the first some of the other characters that you see on tv they're much more over the top and they're dramatic with their intercepts but but yeah i think i think a lot of those groups are getting very very close and chasing almost dangerously. What do you take away from that day? Uh, you know, lessons learned, um, things that, you know, in any tragedy you hope to learn from it. What is it this community took away from that day? Yeah, there, we're learning so much from that day and from that event. Um, El Reno was the day that storm chasing lost its innocence and, and it got real. I mean, the danger is real here. To me, what's most important about that is figuring out what went wrong that day and what we can do to, to prevent something like that from happening again. How can we make it so that there's no more tragedies like this? And to me, that's, that's really educating storm chasers on, on what, what's the most safe positioning you can take on the storm, having a safe escape route, knowing when to take that escape route, and, and knowing the conditions of the storm knowing where that tornado is, knowing um, which way it's moving, and then, and then knowing when to get out of there. To me, those are the critical safety lessons uh, that need to be learned from that event. Speaking of tragedies, another couple, is it what, a couple of deaths occurred? Non-storm related, but um, there was a couple yeah. of guys that you know weren't paying attention to local traffic and something bad happened as well, right? 
this past uh, season here, we had uh, we had a couple of storm chaser fatalities, and that was a that was a, a vehicle, um, a motorist type situation. And we had one group of storm chasers actually run a stop sign. We, what we think was happening was there was probably some distracted driving there, uh-huh. and uh, unfortunately, T boned another storm chaser. So it did not look at all like it was related to a tornado. It just looked like it looked like it was just a bad. Um, a bad accident. And yeah, distracted so driving. Better we, way to put it. And and I'm sure that happens a lot. You know, with, yeah, is that right? It does. Um, there's a lot of technology and a lot of gadgets and gear that's involved with storm chasing. There's a huge, huge push, and there has been for years. Uh, but some just aren't heeding the warnings. Keep your eyes on the road and 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 make sure you're being safe with your driving and you're not being distracted. Again, that's why it's so critical to have a someone with you that can do a lot of that for you some of the news reporting after that uh you know chasers quoted in the news things like that they're just talking like now it's there's almost traffic jams chasing is that is that a real phenomena it is absolutely and it depends on where you are and what time of the year it is but like i said earlier the Oklahoma City area is basically Mecca for storm chasing. Mm-hmm. And if it's a weekend and, and the tornadoes are forecast well in advance, um, you will see hundreds and hundreds of storm chasers um, out there on any particular storm. And if there aren't many roads, you will see a huge conga line of vehicles. It gets dangerous because you know people don't have room to maneuver. They don't have areas to, to park and, and people are distracted or they're driving aggressively or, you know, they might be a little panicky or flighty if, if they're getting too close. So, so, yeah, it is a problem. But fortunately, it's to me, it's more the exception than the norm. Okay. So I've seen, I've seen a few of these traffic jams, but uh, every year I, I'm still amazed to find myself on a very pretty picturesque tornado in the middle of nowhere, Great Plains, and we're, we're the only vehicle out there <laughs> watching it by ourselves. Hopefully in the middle of nowhere so to speak where it's not yeah, endangering someone yet right and that's that's a huge point i have to stress is that you know i never want to see tornadoes hurt people or, or damage their property to me the, the dream catch is watching a tornado out in some deserted isolated corner of the plains you know where it's moving over just empty terrain and the only people and out there to wis- witness it are just a couple of storm chasers and, and maybe a few prairie dogs so. <laughs> are there different types of storm chasers like uh you know are, are there's the newbies the rookies the you guys have names for you know for each you know you got the guy that's you know the weekender the you know whatever i don't know are there names for different I, types of storm chasers that you guys refer to each other as i actually have a very humorous kind of satirical post if you dig through my facebook you might be able to find it okay but i actually have a, i have a whole cliche list of different storm chaser stereotypes and yeah there's there's a bunch there's the newbie chaser and and there's the the spotters and there are the media chasers and yeah there's a whole long list absolutely <laughs> so one of my, one of my favorite groups is what we call the whackers what they like to do is um, decorate their storm chasing vehicles. They they like to be show offs. So they cover their vehicles with antennas and lights and stickers and and all kinds of stuff just to stand out and kind of advertise that they're storm chasers. So yeah, these groups they make fun of each other and are they, are they the type that's got all the stuff? But as they'd say in our favorite movie here, they got no instincts. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> <laughs> there's, you know, they're they're just stereotypes, of course. But yeah, but yeah we we do uh, accuse the whackers sometimes of being all show and 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 not having any real experience behind it. <laughs> <laughs> so how uh, I, I noticed there's a lot of storm chasing tour groups. Actually, I've got a friend of mine. I think he's a common friend on, on at least on your page. Uh, David Cravada. He comes from Florida, a friend of mine that I've known for a little bit. And we were actually talking earlier in the year and he told me he goes out every year and, and, 
and gets in a van and spends a week. Uh, how how do those folks interact with what you're doing? Um, is it, are those groups you see out there, um, are, are these folks yeah. that are, are, are a good thing? Are they funding a lot of the science work that you're doing and making it affordable? They are a good thing, in my opinion. And the reason is, is I feel like the, the tours are taking – a lot of people who don't have the experience, they're interested in storm chasing, they want to know what it's about and experience it, and it's a great way for them to do it safely and not be a danger to themselves and to others. Okay. So these people these people go with the tours and they have an experienced guide take them out there. To me, this, the tour is a beautiful thing because that's 10 to 20 newbies that I don't have to worry about on the road because they're contained in this van. And so, yeah, they're, they're not funding the science, typically, behind storm chasing. Uh, those are commercial ventures where the, the tour owners are, are basically um, at least trying to fund their own storm chasing hobby, and, and they're probably making a little bit of money off of it, too. Gotcha. So. I guess it, it's been four or five, six years ago. I don't know when, but, but Sean Casey had a movie that came out called Tornado Alley. Um, I remember seeing that in IMAX. Great film. I know a lot of the TV show Storm Chasers documented his his uh, his quest to get one of these in the TIV, the Tornado Intercept vehicle. You had some experience with this team. Was it back during the filming of that movie, or is it the next movie he's doing? Or tell me about your experiences with Sean Casey in the TIV. Yeah, so I kind of grew up in storm chasing, watching Sean Casey on TV and his movies. And, you know, the more I got into it and the more people I met, I eventually found myself as part of his group. And it's just kind of amazing because I remember going out and watching Tornado Alley um, in the IMAX theater when I was still pretty much a rookie. And then and then to be out there working on his second movie with him was just a, a, a really incredible experience and, and, a, and a nice opportunity. So, but yeah, we were we were filming his second um, IMAX movie called Extreme Weather, and that just came out last October, and it's still playing in some IMAX screens. And you're in the movie at all? I am kind of. I was in what we call the doghouse. Okay. So, <laughs> it's it's a great name. It's literally like we were kind of the the kind of the backup guys. Uh, we were in the doghouse, and the doghouse was a modified Dodge Ram 2500. It had a specially built camera turret on the top to, to get IMAX shots. It had a steel hail cage so that we could drive right into the storm. And that was basically assisting the TIV. We're not in the movie. We're, we're doing all of the kind of the crew and behind the scenes work uh, that, that you get when you watch some of these movies. So you, you were the crew filming the TIV, filming the weather. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. We're filming the TIV. We're getting extra shots of tornadoes. So. I understand. Still interesting, and and uh, I, I bet just to get out there and be part of a, a funded organization, I suppose. Yeah, it's it's a whole different type of storm chasing than I usually do. Um, I'm usually usually when I'm out there, I am adamant about not getting close and being as safe as I possibly can be. Um, it's a little bit different story when you're chasing with the TIV. Because being an armored vehicle and they're trying to get shots inside the tornado, obviously we have to get extremely close and, and actually wind up in the tornado sometimes. It's something I'm not a, accustomed to. It's, it's, it's a lot more stressful, quite a bit more dangerous. It's also quite a bit different because we are actually out there to do a job. And that's what it turns into. It turns into more, more of a job. And at times it was work. It wasn't all just going out there and, and having an amazing experience and an, an amazing adventure. It was, yeah. it was difficult and, uh, and hard at times. Probably an open-ended question here. What, what scares you? What are the things that scare you the most out there? What scares me the most? That is a, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that scare me. I think the biggest thing is just not knowing if you lose your situational awareness, you lose your grasp on what's happening and whether or not your safety, just, just that unknown. Um, to me, if you don't know what the storm is doing, to me, that's one of the scariest things that can happen. So that, that's often what I'm trying to avoid the most. Just keep my bearings, keep on top of the situation. And, and I guess what should be most scary to me is, you know, the other motorists and the other chasers. And it, it's such a mundane risk, but to, be, to me, it's the de most deadliest thing out there. Driving and, and just common 
motorist accidents. That's the most dangerous part of storm chasing. So what would you say to someone that wanted to get into this? Um, if you're interested in storm chasing, there's a couple of great routes that you can go. I would not recommend going the way I did, which was just kind of going out there and stumbling it upon it on your own for the first time. I would highly, highly recommend you sign up with a tour with the College of DuPage. Mm -hmm. And it's great for your listeners because they are based out of Illinois. Okay. So you drive up to Glen Ellen, uh, where the College of DuPage is. You'll sign up for a 10-day tour in the spring with them. And you get in a van with um, a whole mixed group of meteorology students and people from across the country. And a very experienced meteorologist college professor and and veteran storm chaser will take you out and and bring you up to these storms and along the way you're going to learn all about them so this is a college lab course so you will be learning about meteorology and forecasting and storm structure and how to safely chase you'll get all of that on the way out there and then you'll get to see it in person what's something Uh, like that cost i think the tours usually run about seven hundred dollars and that includes your lodging. It does not include your food. Mm-hmm. And that is absolutely one of the most economical ways to chase. That's cheaper than if you did it by yourself, and they are significantly cheaper than a lot of the other tours. So some of the other tours are more comfy and plush, but because they're subsidized from the college and and they are running efficiently and, and economically, yeah, it's, it's uh, one of the cheapest ways to get out there and experience it. What would you say to somebody that might be listening that says, I do want to go Skip's route and just load up in a van, get a buddy, throw a cooler of food and water, and, a, and just say, I'm headed off, and you know, whenever I see a crowd, I'm going to follow them. I mean, what would you say to that person? Yeah. It's not my place to tell people what they can and can't do. I mean, you're free free to do whatever you want to do. I can only give you suggestions and advice from someone who has a little bit of experience. Um, if you want to, if you want to start doing storm chasing by yourself, my advice to you would be to read as much as you possibly can. Find all of the books on storm chasing. You can go to stormtrack.org and read all of the forum posts that you possibly can. Just educate yourself as best as you can. There are a great number of essays by Chuck Doswell and Al Mohler on chaser safety and chase etiquette those those should be requirements for anyone interested in getting into the hobby but but basically it's educate yourself as best as you can and then after that it's it's be careful what are some of the most famous local tornadoes here in central illinois the the most infamous tornado that happened near this area was the infamous tri-state tornado uh and it happened in march of 1925 so that tornado um went through southern illinois but, uh, but it started in Missouri and went all the way across southern Illinois and then into Indiana. Hundreds of miles of path length. It killed 600 people. That tornado still holds many records. It was on the ground for hours, and it was just an absolute mythical beast. Uh, that tornado has not been topped yet. So not quite central Illinois, but still close enough to home. We get some yeah. of the biggest, most violent tornadoes here the Springfield, Illinois, had a F2 that hit town uh, back in 2006. That was actually mm-hmm. the third tornado that I witnessed, uh, and then that was a big deal. Closer to, to where you're located, um, back in 2011, I saw an EF3 tornado go through Girard, right. and then there was an EF2 that hit Litchfield. Those were yeah, some just, of the more memorable tornadoes that happened. That in one history. crossed I-55 and, and hit, uh, hit a house. I remember that one. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. It was uh, it was a dramatic tornado, a big white cone is what that one looked like. And uh, and the one that we saw up in Girard actually spooked us pretty good. We were watching the tornado from the east, and we were following parallel to it. And we thought it would maintain its, its course. And I violated one of my biggest chasing rules was I lost sight of the tornado, and I no longer had tabs on where it was and what, is, what it was doing. That should be my cue to, to back off from the storm and get out of there. But I kept going, assuming that that tornado would still be right there when we when we emerged from town. So we drove through town with no view. And then when we came out of town on the north side, we realized the tornado had turned towards us and it crossed the road right in front of us and really startled us. Wow. So yeah, and, and that was the closest I've been to a to a significant tornado. What so. were the dates on those? You you have chase logs on those? People could go back and, and, and look that up, yeah. up on your website? 
Yeah, if you're interested in, in the Girard tornado, that occurred on April 19th of 2011. So, and my chase logs are all arranged by date. So. Yeah, I, like I said, plethora of information out there to really follow along with what you've done and where you've gone. What are some myths out there of tornadoes that people tend to believe that might not actually be real or, or true? Yeah, there's a number of myths that I hear all the time from people when I'm out storm chasing. One of the things is when we park and, and we get out of the vehicle and we're watching that storm, a lot of the locals will stop and, and ask what we're doing. And that inevitably leads into them telling their own tornado stories. And so we love to hear that. And one of the things I hear all the time from, from people when we're out there watching is that, oh, we don't get tornadoes here because there's a river or there's a hill or the storm splits and it and it always goes north of town or <laughs> uh, there's Indian burial grounds, you know, and that keeps us safe or, you know, there's the storm never hits the city. It's always out in the country. I've heard a hundred different reasons why a tornado won't hit a particular area and they're all wrong. They're all just local legends. It's just that particular spot hasn't been hit until someday it is hit. So um, there's, there's usually no basis to any of that. So if you think you're protected by a hill or a river or a lake, um, you're probably wrong. There's just a bunch of, a lot of silly stuff I hear all the time, like um, you should open your windows before the tornado hits because it equalizes the pressure in the house. Otherwise, the house might explode, and that's not true. <laughs> okay. uh, your house will easily ventilate itself. Uh, and besides, the tornado is going to blow out your windows anyways, so you don't need to open them. But yeah, don't waste your time doing that. What you want to do is you want to get to the lowest level that you have, your basement hopefully, um, and you want to put as many walls as you can between you and the outside. So Great, great point. But, uh, it actually brings up a question. We had a question submitted. I think it was on, on your website uh, from a Sarah Weirs, and she wanted to know, what do you do if you say you're traveling and your phone goes off because all of our phones now have emergency alerts on them and the phone goes off and says, hey, this is a tornado right where you are. Um, you're traveling. You don't know the area. You're in your car. What do you do? This brings up one of the biggest myths of all time. And, and people think that when there's a tornado and they're driving on the highway, they should stop under an overpass because they think that overpass makes great shelter. And it doesn't. It doesn't at all. Uh, this is one of the one of the more dangerous myths that I encounter, um, and I see this all the time when I'm storm chasing, and the weather starts to get bad. The traffic starts to line up under those overpasses, and the problem is there was a video back in 1991. Um, one of the most strongest tornadoes hit Andover, Kansas. Uh, it was a big tornado outbreak. There was a TV crew out filming one of these tornadoes. It was it was. Uh, Later in the tornado's life, it was actually a weakening tornado, and it was kind of following them. They were driving ahead of it, but it was behind them. And they decided that they needed to stop and take shelter, and they used an overpass to do it. So they got out of their vans, they climbed up underneath the girders, and they held on as the tornado passed nearby. It didn't go right over the top of them. It was close, but it didn't, it didn't hit them directly. And it wasn't as big as they get, but... When people saw these guys under the girders hanging on and coming out okay, they thought, hey, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that if there's a tornado. And we found out in subsequent years that it's actually one of the worst things you can do. Um, on May 3rd, 1999, there was a deadly tornado outbreak in Oklahoma. Some of the traffic on, on the highways attempted to use those overpasses as shelter. People were actually leaving their houses and trying to take shelter under under overpasses. And... There was an F5 that went through town, and every single overpass that that tornado moved over, there were fatalities there. And what we've discovered happens is the overpass actually ends, winds up acting like a wind tunnel. So wind gets focused through that overpass, and anything under there will get blown out or obliterated with debris. So you absolutely don't want to be under there. Um, it's a terrible place to be. If you want to be underground or in a, in a safe room or a, inside in a sturdy building. The other thing is people actually don't wind up using the overpass even as shelter. What I usually see is people just kind of stop on the side of the road near the overpass, and they think, oh, if there's a tornado, I'm, I'm going to get out and I'm going to go up in there. But the problem is a lot of times you can't see the tornado. You're not looking in the right place. So you're just sitting in your car on the side of the road, and then you get hit by the tornado. 
being in a vehicle is one of the worst places you can be in a tornado. They, they fly through the air. They act like little tin cans. They're absolute death traps. You don't want to be in your car in a tornado. So, and stopping on the overpass is, actually causes a huge backup in the traffic. It's crazy. It creates a lot of really dangerous conditions. So that's one of the things I stress the most is please do not stop under overpasses um, if, you're a, if you're in one of those situations. So um, the low-lying the trick, ditch theory is that yeah is that what to do that's the next big question i get is okay there's a tornado and i and i'm in a car what do what do i do do i go in the ditch or or do i sit in my car or do i try to drive away from it what do i do um none of those are good are good choices if there's a tornado barreling down on you and you're in the car and there's and and it's kind of that that last moment you you don't really have a good option at that point there there's some evidence that says if you leave your vehicle and get in the lowest spot on the ground as you can and, and cover your head and your neck with your arms, um, your chances might be a little bit better faring that tornado. But it's still a terrible place to be in a terrible situation to be. You know, what you want to do is you never want to be in that situation to begin with. And you can do that just by staying on top of the forecast and, and being kind of weather savvy. So what you're going to do is if you're taking a road trip, you just want to stay on top of the weather. Check the forecast before you go. It's rare. This doesn't happen every day. But if the forecast says this afternoon there's the possibility of severe weather or tornadoes, you might think, hey, maybe this is not a great day to drive. Maybe I shouldn't be, shouldn't be out there today. Maybe I can do this a different day. But if it's important and you go anyways, you still want to be watching those weather updates. Three to four hours before the tornadoes form, Usually a tornado watch will come out. You want to pay attention to that. Watch it on the TV, listen to the radio, um, pull it up on your phone if you can. The National Weather Service uh, webpage will tell you that. You don't want to be driving across a tornado watch because in that tornado watch is this big box across the state. We're expecting thunderstorms that are going to be producing severe weather and tornadoes. Reschedule your drive. Don't do it. Um, if you're out there anyways, the next step is what happens is we start to get thunderstorm development and just don't drive into those storms. If you see a storm up ahead, stop and turn around and, and drive away from that storm. Um, if you're near, if you're near a dangerous storm, if you're getting a warning now on your, on your radio or your phone, what you want to do is you want to get to a, a sturdy, a sturdy structure or shelter. If you can just exit the highway before the storm, before you get into that weather and, and find some place that you can go. The, just the trick is just to not be in that situation and, and just to stay ahead of it. But if for some godforsaken reason you are on the highway and there's a tornado right in front of you and you're now wondering what to do, what you should do is carefully just stop, take a deep breath, don't panic. Got some moments to consider here. Like one of the worst things you can do is panic. So just watch that tornado for a few moments. Look to see which way it's going. Is it moving to the right? Or is it moving to the left? If it's moving to the right, it's going to pass to your right. If it's moving to the left, it should miss you to the left. The tornado isn't moving right or left. It's probably coming right at you. What you want to do is you want to look at which way it's going and you want to drive the opposite direction. If you're there um, and you're just, looking at your phone and you got a radar from cell tower yeah. or whatever, what's the yeah. worst part of that storm to be in when you're looking at the radar? That's a whole topic, too. I, I don't know how in-depth I should get here. Um, well, the reason I ask is I always a, hear the TV guys going, oh, if you're in that, you know, that, uh, that southwest corner, you know, that's, yeah. that's the danger zone. If you're north of it, typically you're not going to get the rotation that you would down at the end, at the hook. Right. To, to me, that's more of a storm-chasing question. Is, okay. Is what, where, where's the tornado going to be? I, I feel like it's a little bit dangerous to be getting into that trying to give advice like that to, to the average motorist or the average resident. Um, it's great for the TV because they can show you on the radar exactly where the tornado is and what part of the storm it is. That's great. Um, if you're looking at the radar yourself and, and you don't really know what you're doing, um, it, it can get a little tricky because tornadoes turn directions. They can form in different parts of the storm. They can form very quick, quickly under rapidly changing conditions. So there's a great app. It's called Radar Scope. It will show you the storms in, in all their detail. And you can try to look for that hook echo. That's the a little curly cue at the southwest corner of the storm. That's 
typically where most significant tornadoes form. That's the area, of course, that you want to uh, avoid. But radar scope will also show you the tornado warning. So it'll show you a big red polygon shape around that storm. And you just want to make sure that you're not in that polygon if you're driving around. A few more questions for you, Skip. Um, I'm sure you, you know, you said, you know, the, the most beautiful sight in the world is a tornado going across the open prairie where nobody's seeing it besides you and a few prairie dogs. I am sure you've been out there when you have seen a tornado hit a structure, a town. There's been property damage. There's been injury and loss of life. How hard is that for you? Um, as you go through this, I can speak, I, I speak about this myself. I'm a volunteer firefighter. I've seen my share of this stuff in my own local community. I'm sure when you're out there, you, you, you probably go through this range of emotions like, oh, this is awesome to, oh my God, this is the worst thing possible. Most of the times I'm, I'm trying to chase in an area where that's not going to happen. I'm trying to chase the most isolated and deserted parts of the plains, but inevitably these tornadoes do strike people and communities. And when that happens, the tone of the chase becomes much more sober and, and sombering. And then it's how can we help if we can help at all? And for many storm chasers, the way you help is to just stay out of the way, stay away from the disaster. Don't become a victim yourself and don't try to hamper the emergency effort that is, is underway. Some chasers are trained first responders and they can help people and it's and I've actually found myself the first on the scene um, in, a, in a disaster and, and, and have helped people when I can. But for the most part, I'm, I'm avoiding that as much as possible. And it's very rare for me to encounter something like that. And I, and I try to prepare myself as, as best as I can for it because these, these tragedies, these, they change people. And I know storm chasers who have stopped chasing and, and, it's, and it's radically affected their lives because they witnessed something horrific. Um, when they were out there. So I just try to prepare myself for that as best as I can, and, and that helps a little bit. You know, in about 15 years of storm chasing, that's only happened to me just a, a, a couple of times okay. where, you know, I came upon a house that had just been hit by a tornado and somebody needs my help. Yeah, well, so. that's good. I know that's the, I mean, like I said, being a firefighter, I get, I'm the guy that gets called into those, not just tornado and, and things like that, but. They don't call us out for many easy things. That's that's the that's the yeah. thing, and, and those things do stick with you. I can certainly uh, attest to that. Tell me about Storm Assist. Right. So that's a great lead-in because you know we're out there witnessing these these storms and these tornadoes, and I'm I'm not out there to gawk at disaster. I'm out there to see something rare and beautiful and powerful, and I I never want to see it impact people, but but. They do sometimes, and, and tragedies happen. So it, it becomes a matter of how can I give back? How can I help these people that have been impacted by the weather that I'm out there trying to document? And, and for some people, that is acting as a first responder or acting as a trained weather spotter to report these tornadoes to the weather service so they can issue warnings to the public. For some people, they, they help after the disaster and clean up and, and recovery. Uh, one of the ideas that we came up with was let's organize uh, a way to to get um, monetary relief and aid to to storm victims. So uh, a group of storm chasers from across the country and myself got together and we came up with Storm Assist. It's a 501c3 um, nonprofit organization. We are 100% volunteer. And, and what we do is we have annual fundraisers where we raise money for tornado victims. And then um, when a tornado strikes a town, we get together and we say, okay, how can we help this community as best we can? And what we wind up doing is we send, we send aid to local organizations, um, debit cards down to residents um, that have lost their homes. Uh, we'll, we'll send money down to, to pet shelters and, and schools. Whatever local organization can, can most benefit from, from our small kind of grassroots contributions and, and that way we can do the most good with the limited funds that we have without any overhead. So, yeah, it's just our way of giving back to the people that we see affected by this weather. And how do you raise, and mo how do you raise money for that? So as storm chasers, we're out there documenting tornadoes and storms. And we, we thought, hey, we have all of these great photos and, and videos. How can we use that and, to raise a little bit of money and, and give that back to communities? So we, we have prints of calendars that show some of the beautiful photographs of 
of storms and weather that people get. And we put out an annual DVD and Blu-ray production where we have some of the more dramatic sequences from storm chasing. So it's like Twister, but it's for real this time. So if you want to see what chasing is really like and, and get kind of that, that Twister type vibe, but for real, um, you can buy one of our DVDs and we, we do one of those every year and they have some of the best and most dramatic tornado shots of the year. So, and then 100% of the profits from all of those sales will go back to go back to uh, storm hit communities. But sometimes we have individual fundraisers as well. If there's a if there's a significant disaster, we'll do a t-shirt sale and, and to raise money for a particular event. When Moore, Oklahoma was hit in 2013 by an EF5, we we're actually able to raise $15,000 through a, a t-shirt sale and that money went to the Moore Public Schools. They had a devastating hit there. Uh, and a number of kids were killed in that tornado. So, how can people help? Their website? Yeah, if you, yeah, if you want to help, um, it's stormassist.org, and we sell T-shirts and, and DVDs, and, and that's a great way to to get a a really cool product and, and see some cool shots of tornadoes and, and pictures, and, and know that that you're helping anyone who's been hit by those storms. So all well, that money will be used. I tell you, you sent me the YouTube link of uh, a tornado that you had shot. I think it was in Ray. Is it Ray, Colorado? Is that the yeah. one you sent me? I had that same feeling of this is what it must mean to you. The same feeling I got from the eclipse was you just the formation, the time it took, the rotation and the things that were going into that you you captured not only the tornado but the, what 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 spoke to me is you caught the tornado in context of everything that was going on around it and then you got a beautiful I'm I'm using maybe I'm using the wrong word it was a stovepipe tornado yeah and, and exactly. just phenomenal I will post that link to uh, to when we put the show out but I think I saw that's been viewed two point five million times is that right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, Ray Ray is one of my best shots. It's it's the closest that I can come to try and conveying to you what what storm chasing is like and and what it means. And and it's it doesn't do it justice. You have to be there and you have to experience it. Um and that's not for everyone, of course. I mean, like you said, the the total solar eclipse is just an awesome spectacle in the sky. And to me that that storm chasing is standing in front of that tornado and being completely overwhelmed. Yeah, and that that's it. Skip, as we're recording this, the date is 9-11. Um, yesterday, Irma hit Florida on 9-10. Where were you the last week? So my wife wanted to get out of town, and she actually booked us on a cruise in the middle of hurricane season. It's kind of off-season, and the rates are cheap, so why not, right? Uh, but you roll the dice. Usually you can go through the Caribbean and, and be fine, but of course we hop on this cruise ship and Irma had just formed in the Atlantic and it is barreling towards the Caribbean. I thought, oh no, is this going to affect us? Our cruise was actually turned around early. We had to leave port uh, a half day early or so. They raced the boat back to Florida as quickly as they could. They dumped us on uh, at Port Canaveral, which is a barrier island. Not a good place to be in a hurricane because it floods and it gets the full brunt of the hurricane's winds. Then they said, anyone who wants to stay is welcome. We're going back out to sea. That ship turned around and went back out into the Atlantic for a number of days to run from that storm. Uh, but we had to go home. So we got off in Florida. We had reservations in our hotel the following two nights, but the island was being evacuated. Mandatory evacuation at 3 p.m. The next day, our hotel was technically closed, but they let us stay there for the night for $10, <laughs> which is pretty nice. So we stayed there that night. Uh, the weather was still absolutely beautiful, clear skies, and, and some waves are starting to come in, but, but pretty calm otherwise. And the next morning, we started, um, we started our evacuation. We had to get out there. Um, our flight was canceled because it was supposed to happen right during the middle of the hurricane. So we had no flight out. There were no more seats on any airlines out of there. So the only way we had out was to drive. And fortunately, we found a rental car in Orlando. So we hopped a shuttle early the next day to Orlando. We drove out of Florida, or we attempted to. It was, it was quite the ordeal. Um, of course, much of Florida was evacuating. So we got caught in a huge 
traffic jam, just stop and go traffic for hours. And all of the gas stations were out. And we tried to exit uh, at one time to stop. And we realized it was a terrible mistake. There was so much traffic trying to get on the highway. And the gas stations were all closed. And all the businesses were closed. And the police were frantically trying to direct traffic. And people were shouting and honking their horns. And luckily, we were able to get back on the highway. Just exiting the highway was a huge mistake. We were rear-ended. Luckily, there was no damage. Wow. And we were almost rear-ended again. We saw a couple of other traffic accidents as we were going north in the in the traffic. Lots of people had run out of gas or had broken down. We saw the shoulder was littered with cars. They were evacuating using the left shoulder, so people were driving on the left shoulder. Unfortunately, the left shoulder is is often not best maintained, and it has a lot of debris in it. So we saw at least two people lose their tires uh, driving on that side of the road. And uh, But we finally made it to Georgia from Orlando after six hours. Wow. And we were able to get gas there and keep going. And then, and then you know, we spent the next day still driving back to Illinois, and the traffic was still bad. And we saw Florida drivers all the way up into Illinois. So wow. just it was it was heartbreaking to see how people were displaced. We stopped for gas in in Kentucky or Tennessee and and the the van next to us was just filled with stuff. People had put everything in their house in this van. There were house plants in the back. <laughs> uh, three generations of people. I saw grandma in there and the kids and, and they were just sitting on piles of stuff and and for for us, I mean, we're just driving home from vacation, but it's just beginning for these people. They're wow. evacuating. They don't know if their home is going to get is going to be there when they go back. Yeah. So yeah, it was tough. It was a tough situation. And uh, some of my friends went down there to chase that hurricane. And it's it's something that I don't get into myself. Um, I, I'm more of a tornado chaser. Um, I've never I've never gone after a hurricane. It's a completely different ball game. Just like. Baseball players and football players are, are playing a completely different sport. Um, hurricane chasing is, is a totally different thing. I haven't gotten into it, into it myself. Um, but, yeah, some of my friends were down there. Fortunately, it turned out to be not as bad as it could have been. Um, the storm weakened just before it hit land. Right. And then Florida fared pretty well. Um, it, it was like it was ready for that storm. Because yeah. my folks have a place down in Cape Coral, and, and uh, fortunately uh, – it sounds like they have minor damage. So yeah, my, yeah, my it brother's deal could have been a lot worse. Yeah, my brother's just uh, east of Tampa, and uh, yeah, oh, even yeah. last night they had power, but no, no TV. Cell signal was poor, and I was pretty much just texting them. It's it's fifty miles south southeast of you. It's twenty five. It's gonna move to the east. It's gonna the eye's gonna move through Lakeland. Oh. You're gonna be on the western side of the eye. And he so oh, they he, rode the storm out there. Yeah. Huh? Well, yeah. he's got some pets and they couldn't leave him. And uh, and yeah. it's, essentially, he said the only thing that he had some damage. He had a, a tree kind of uproot, but he's gonna be able to put it back down. And a lot of debris, a lot of mess, but uh, overall yeah. he fared it fared it well, thank God. Uh, yeah, but great. yeah, I think the irony for you is, Skip, uh, you're a storm chaser, and this time the storm chased you all the way back to <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> it absolutely did. You know, this morning we got up and we looked out the window and we could see the clouds from Irma, uh, like encroaching from the southwest on the horizon. So yeah. It, it totally chased us home. <laughs> Couple of the things I like to do on the show, uh, just out of context of what we've been talking about, it's kind of a get to know you segment of all my guests. Would you like to play along a little bit? Sure. Sure. So, what was the first job you ever had, Skip? My first job was as a line man or what we call a ramp rat um, at a small community airport. So it was my job to run around putting gas in airplanes when they came up to the pumps. I was washing airplanes and putting them putting them in hangars, small Cessnas and, and small twin engine airplanes. Well, so it was a ton of fun, and uh, and it had some great perks. Occasionally, pilots would come and give me rides in the planes. And yeah, that's an cool. Absolute blast job. Yeah. What would uh, what was your favorite Christmas gift you ever got as a kid? Well, maybe not even as a favorite. kid, even now. Your favorite Christmas gift ever? Boy, that's. <laughs> I've got a funny one. Go ahead. Um, That's perfect. When I, was, when I was three or four, I asked my parents for a remote control snake. And they're like, <laughs> what? What is – that doesn't exist. <laughs> so, of course, I didn't get it. That's a, a silly, goofy thing that isn't out there. So, But for some reason, I thought that would be a great idea. 
Well, when I was 20 or so years old, they found it. They saw a remote <laughs> control snake for sale. You had so to, I, got had to buy it. It. I finally got it That's like awesome. about 15 to 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. When you're driving around and you're with, maybe you're with some people or what, or maybe you're not, what's the song that comes on the radio that you're probably most embarrassed to let anybody know you know all the words to? Oh, man. Yeah, it's embarrassing, I guess. That's that's the point of the question. It's, I'm a huge Kimbra fan. I don't know if you know Kimbra. I do not. Uh, no. A pop singer, female from New Zealand. And and so um, so yeah, I love her music, and and I will jam Kimbra by myself all the way out to Kansas. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll I'll loop songs and listen to that. But yeah, I've subjected the students on the COD chase trips to Kimbra too already. So what what's a song? That, how would a song, song by Kimbra go? She sings a song called "Settle Down," and uh, that's one of my favorites. How's it go? How's yeah. it go? She says, I want to settle down. I want to settle down. And yeah, basically, it's just about her wanting to find a guy and, and just. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying yeah. I was so, trying to Jedi mind trick you into singing. That's that. That, that was my attempt there. <laughs> I, I am a terrible singer. I would I would do it if I could. You know, a uh, question I don't normally ask, <laughs> but I, I think it's, uh, you know, we, like I said, we are taping this on 9-11. Where were you? on 9-11, 2001. Yeah, I was in college at, at U of I, UIUC, and uh, I had just come out of the dorms at uh, Florida Avenue residence, and I got on the, the 21 quad bus to get to class, and the driver had the radio on, which was really, really weird. They never had the radio on, so that just seems super bizarre to me. And I sat down, and then the woman next to me on the bus told me that a plane had hit the trade towers and it didn't register i didn't know what she meant i thought it, what 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 does that mean it was it was it an accident how how bad could it be so yeah and then when i got to when i got to school when i got to class i got out and went to the bookstore and they had it on all the tvs of course and we just watched it yeah. they still had class that day and uh, our, our professor told us he says this will probably be the most pivotal moment in history in your lives but today we're going to learn about slide rules. So and then he, he took out a ruler, and then we started with class right after that. Well, so. kept you focused on maybe some normalcy that day, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. A couple more lighthearted questions. What would you go back and tell yourself as a 12-year-old kid? Um, I would say just follow your, your passions and your interests as hard as you can and, and study as hard as you can. Um, because to me, that's where the best opportunities in life come from mm -hmm. is, is follow your interests and, and make sure you have the right tools and, and, and opportunities to, to pursue them. So right. totally. Yeah. Awesome. Last question. There's a TV show out there where Skip Talbot is a character on the show. I'd be on it like maybe an action or an adventure show. Or like a suspense or crime drama, but I would be the nerd, kind of in the lab or in the corner or behind the bank of computers. <laughs> I'd be like that. I'd be that guy that the main characters are going to for for an answer. So like you know, like a, the, the hacker guy that has to look something up on the computer, or he's he's in the lab pulling up a result <laughs> and giving it to somebody. That that's, would be me. That's awesome. It's a good answer. You'd be like on CSI or. Y five O or one of those shows where they gotta go get go I don't know, get to, let's talk to Skip and, and Skip's got it all there. <laughs> That's good. So Skip, I, I wanna thank you again for your time. It's been a blast talking to you. Um really can't thank you enough for coming on the show and really explaining to everyone out there. It's an interest a lot of people have, but now they know talking to you really what's it like to be a storm chaser. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I loved it. Yeah, great. All right. Take care, buddy. Yeah, you too. And uh, good luck on your podcast. Well, there you have it. Skip Talbot. Great guest. Uh, I hope to have him back on again next spring. And maybe just as he gets back from chase season, give us a recap of everything that he may have went through in the 2018 storm chasing season. If you want to follow along or get caught up on what Skip's done in the past, great resources out there. Let me run a couple of websites past you here skip.cc s-k-i-p 
Dot .cc that is a website and that's for Skip Talbot's Storm Chasing Chronicles a lot of the logs that he's done in past storm chases they're very detailed and you can also search on Facebook for Skip Talbot's Storm Chasing Chronicles and you'll find it on there as well you can follow the page he posts a lot of stuff out there so if you want to follow him as he gets going again back in the spring and when he's active you'll certainly be able to be caught up there he also mentioned uh, Storm Assist. If you go out to the Storm Assist website, you can just Google Storm Assist and everything that they're doing there to help raise funds for folks that were affected by severe weather. They do a great thing there by giving back. As you heard Skip say, they're not out there to document carnage. They're out there to document the beauty, the wonder, and the awe of these tornadoes. And, and sometimes people are affected by that. So while they're documenting it and recording those videos, they package all those together and it's DVDs, it's it, it's Blu-rays, it's things like that you can buy to help out T-shirts and whatnot. So if you're if you're inclined, go out to Storm Assist and and help those folks out as well. I want to end today's show with a friend of mine. Uh, I want to talk to Greg Shively. Greg has been a friend of mine for a number of years. He actually grew up in the Kansas Plains and actually had a dog named Toto. So I want to talk to him about what it was like growing up in 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 that area of the country when torn. What's that? What? Hey, are you done talking yet? We're out of time. Gone on for way too long already. We need it needs it needs to end sometime. All right, buddy. Sorry. We'll get you next time. This was a long episode. I'm sorry we ran out of time again. So there you have it. Another episode of the What's That Like podcast. Another couple good guests we got coming up. I think I'm gonna have my first repeat guest here in the next month or so, and I think you'll be looking forward to hearing from from that person. And we've got some new folks coming up in October and into November as well that I think you're gonna enjoy. And once again, this has been John Knowles on the What's That Like podcast. Peace out. What's That Like is available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Search for What's That Like. Subscribe today and never miss an episode. Streaming is available at SoundCloud.com and on the SoundCloud app. Follow What's That Like at Facebook.com slash What's That Like Podcast and on Twitter at What's That Like Pod. All opinions of the guests of the What's That Like Podcast are their own, not necessarily the views of the host or the podcast producers. We hope you enjoy this podcast serving Central Illinois and beyond. Peace out!